<laughs> but I find that that's true just about everywhere. If you've ever been on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, that's about the only road in America that is always under construction. It never finishes. Oh, well, good morning. You know, it, it's funny that Sandy mentioned it because I was going to, you know, I like to open with a joke, loosen things up before I hit you with the truth. <laughs> but I was going to mention it this morning, what Sandy had mentioned, that maybe we should change from the fruit of the spirit theme to a Noah's Ark theme just in case. <laughs> I know the farmers are happy. Uh, most of us, maybe not. But I can confirm for about three and a half seconds this morning, we all saw the sun yeah. out that window. So it's still out there somewhere. Well, this morning we're going to go ahead and continue in this uh, study through the book of Philippians. So if you're going to follow along, we're in Philippians. We are still in Philippians 1. And we'll be looking at verses 12 through 18 this morning. Uh, this morning we're going to specifically talk about the topic of control. Having control, having control of our lives. You know, it's interesting because having control of our lives is something that I think we all desire. We all want to have control of our lives, and it's something that I think starts at a very young age. In fact, thinking about the idea of having control of my life, it reminded me of, you know, my kids. Oftentimes in the evenings, especially on the weekends, We'll throw a movie on, and we'll all sit on the couch and watch a movie. And oftentimes, we'll have a snack. And most of my family is fond of ice cream. So we'll go get a bowl of ice cream, and, and I get a bowl of ice cream. Right? Not some little thing or a cup. Like, if I'm going to eat ice cream, it's going to be a bowl of ice cream, which is why we don't keep it in the house. Um, but anyway, I'll go get a bowl of ice cream, and I'll go to the couch, and I'll sit on the couch, and I'll enjoy the ice cream. And then the kids want to sit on the couch and enjoy the ice cream, but I have to point out, no, you need to go sit at the table and eat your ice cream at the table. And you have to explain to them, well, you know, it's, it's my couch and I paid for it and it's my carpet and if I ruin it, I will have to pay to have it cleaned or replaced. If you ruin it, I have to pay to have it cleaned or replaced. So, you just go ahead and sit at the table. But I think that starts that whole process in our kids that they want to have control, right? They want to be an adult. Because when I'm an adult, I can pick my own bedtime. I can eat whatever I want to eat. I can stay up as late as I want to stay up. I can have whatever amount of friends that I want to have. We see that in our kids. They want control. We experience it ourselves even my age right now, right? I want to have control. Oftentimes I don't. My kids control my schedule, right? I have to go to work. And, and I'm fortunate enough that I have a job where, for the most part, I can control most aspects of my job. But most of us have a boss who is telling us what to do. And we're trying to climb the ladder and get promoted so that we can have more control over our work life. We want control. And ultimately, it all culminates in retirement, right? We live for retirement, it seems like, because when we retire, I can have total control of my life. I don't have a boss that's telling me what to do anymore. I don't have kids in the house. I have an empty nest. And yes, the grandkids might come over, but then I can push them back on their parents and say, it's time to go home. I can have control over what I do when I do it, how I do it, who I do it with, total freedom. And you know, it, that's true, I think, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're a Jesus follower or not, we all want to have control. In fact, if you go to Google and just Google having control of your life, it'll yield some 5.2 billion search results. Some of us, though, some of us take control to the extreme, right? There's that word control freak, right? That we know somebody, maybe you're that person, but we all know somebody who is a control freak, right? We try to control every aspect of our lives and we do that even to the detriment of other people. We're gonna have and maintain control of our lives sometimes 
at the expense of friendships, at the expense of relationship, sometimes even to the detriment of work projects or school projects. And when we lose control, if we lose any aspect of control, we begin to panic, right? We begin to worry as if there's some gland inside of us that starts spasming because we're losing control and we get panicked and worried because we feel like if I lose any aspect of control, then I'm going to lose all control. And that panics us. We're worried that if we lose control, who knows what's going to happen to me? Who knows what's going to happen to my life? I'll probably end up 35 years old, divorced, living in a van down by the river. And not to make too much fun of that, it's actually a Saturday Night Live skit with David Spade and Chris Farley. But it, it legitimately causes us concern. Most of us, on the idea of losing control of certain aspects of our life, get legitimate concerns and emotionally affect Max Lucado writes that anxiety is often the consequence of perceived chaos. If we sense that we are victims of unseen, turbulent, random forces, we're troubled. And that's why the most stressed out people are control freaks. Control feet, uh, freaks fail at the quest that they most pursue. The more they try to control the world, the more they realize that they cannot, and life becomes a cycle of anxiety, failure, anxiety, failure, anxiety, failure. And listen to this, what he says. We cannot take control because control is not ours to take. We cannot take control because control is not ours to take. And as you'll see in the text this morning, the Apostle Paul realized that. The Apostle Paul knew that he never really had control to begin with. And as a result, it gave him peace in his life, even in the most trying of circumstances. So we're in Philippians 1.12. And as we begin, I want to point out the fact, and we discussed this last week, the Philippian church, the church in Philippi, was concerned for the Apostle Paul. I mean, they were genuinely concerned, I think, because... They saw churches being persecuted by the Jews. They saw Christians being put to death at the hands of Rome because of the Jews. And now they see the Apostle Paul has been arrested. He's being taken to Rome. He's on house arrest, awaiting trial. And I'm sure they're asking questions like, will we ever see Paul again? Right? What's going to happen to Paul? Is he going to be put to death? What will happen to the churches that Paul established, what will happen to Paul's ministry? And they're genuinely concerned for Paul, and they express that to the Apostle Paul. And Paul addresses their concerns in verse 12. Paul says this, Philippians 1, verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, and I want to pause here and just point out the fact that when Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that includes sisters. Okay, that's brothers and sisters. Paul is addressing the church congregation as a whole. In fact, Paul later writes to the church in Galatia, in Galatians 3, discussing this very thing. Paul writes that there are no, or there is no male or female. Remember, the Jewish culture was a very patriarchal culture, and the men were actually counted as more significant or important as the women. Jesus came, and he completely threw that out the window. What Paul is saying is that there is no hierarchical structure anymore. There is no patriarchy. That we are all equally significant. That we are all joint heirs with Christ. There is no one person that is better than the other. So even though Paul says, I want you to know brothers, that's brothers and sisters. Okay, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. What an outlook on an absolutely terrible circumstance. If you weren't here last week or you're not aware of what Paul has dealt with, Paul, go read 2 Corinthians. Paul has been through a lot. He has been beat, 
several times. He has been whipped several times. He's been stoned. He's been shipwrecked three times. And now he has been falsely accused of starting a riot in Jerusalem, and they are dragging him to Rome to stand trial. Paul is under arrest for something that he did not do. And if that was me, I'd have complained. Right? I'd have had that millennial attitude of whining and complaining, right? I did nothing wrong. Why am I under arrest here? I broke no law. Now I'm in prison. Now I can't do my job. I can't minister to the churches. I can't plant new churches. Paul could have said, I feel annoyed. I feel anxious. I feel worried. I'm overwhelmed. I'm out of control. Paul could have done what most of us have a tendency of doing and asked God, why is this happening to me? Why, God? Why do I have to deal with this? But he didn't. Paul didn't. He didn't complain at all. You see, Paul understands that everything happens for a reason. And I know that we understand that. We get that everything happens to us for a reason. We all know Romans 8, 28, written by the Apostle Paul, for we know that God works all things out to the good for those who love him and who have been called according to his service, to his purpose. Which means that if you live your life for God and under God's sovereign rule, if you are a believer in Jesus, everything that happens to you and everything that happens in your life happens for a very distinct purpose purpose. It's part of God's plan. We still complain. Even knowing that. The Apostle Paul here doesn't complain. He focuses on that truth. The fact that this is happening to me for a very distinct purpose. And although I might not understand it right now, I might not understand it ever, but he trusts in God. And Paul knows that if it's happening to me, that means that God has ordained it. And if God has ordained it, I'm not going to fight it. Because God has a purpose for it. And whether or not it was the primary purpose, God will use me, Paul says, in this circumstance to advance the gospel. To tell other people about Jesus. And that, you know, is a very hard truth sometimes for us to accept. And that would be our, our first hard truth for this morning, is the truth that sometimes the things that happen to us in our lives, even the unfortunate things, the moments that we feel lost, the moments that we feel out of control, even the things that bring about negative consequences, sometimes those things are set in place by God, simply for the purpose of advancing the gospel. Simply to let others know about Christ. And I think we're all aware of this, and it might sound kind of mean, but it's true. This world does not revolve around me. <clears throat> this world doesn't revolve around me, it doesn't revolve around us. This world revolves because God makes it spin. And while we are on this earth, as Jesus followers, Christ has given us a mission. And that mission was to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that we have learned, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Paul understood that. And Paul understood that God is not here to serve me. But I am here to serve God. The sooner that we arrive at a point where we can accept that truth, I'm convinced the more at peace we will be in our life circumstances, even when the negative stuff happens to us. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Verse 13. So that, that is because of what has happened to me, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. 
And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. I mean, look at what God accomplished through Paul because of Paul's unfortunate circumstance. Because of something that we would have complained about. And Paul doesn't. Paul sees what God has done through his life. Paul witnesses to every Roman guard that's attached to him. If you go back and read Acts, it documents, the second part of Acts documents Paul and his ministry, and it documents the process of Paul being arrested and taken to Rome. There was a Roman guard attached to Paul 24 hours a day. Every single Roman guard that Paul ran into heard about Jesus, whether they wanted to or not. Paul used his opportunity to talk to others about Christ. Even Roman governors, Roman emperors, Roman kings, Paul appeared before all of them. In fact, in Acts 26, Paul appears before King Agrippa, a Roman king. And you know what Paul said to him? Paul didn't say, I'm innocent. Paul didn't plead his case for forgiveness and ask to be set free. Paul says to King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate that I am before you. He didn't whine to him about how he got arrested or why he got arrested. He didn't ask to be set free. He said, I am considering it fortunate that I am before you because now I have the opportunity to tell you about Jesus. These aren't the words of a man who is wrapped up in his own self-pity because of all of these terrible things that have happened to him. This was a man who is confident that God has a purpose for me. And God has a purpose for what is happening to me. The other thing that happened with Paul's imprisonment, as he states, Paul's unfortunate circumstances and his loss of control has provided encouragement to other people. So not just that he could minister and preach Jesus to the Roman guards and officials, but he is encouraging other people. He said, most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word. What Paul is dealing with in his life right now is both indirectly and directly strengthening and encouraging other believers in Jesus. And we, we all understand. I think if you really think about it, you can think of a time in your life where something bad happened to you. You found a way to get through it and persevere, and somebody told you that really encouraged me. It really built up my strength. You know, I can't tell you, and not bragging or tooting my own horn here by any means, but when Kara and I dealt with a daughter that had cancer, and dealt with two craniotomies in four months of chemotherapy, and eventually she succumbed to the cancer. And I heard from multiple pastors that we've heard from people about how they weren't really going to church, and they weren't praying, but they heard about your circumstance, and they started praying. And, and it brought them closer to God, and it, it encouraged them. It, it gave them hope. Sometimes... Our circumstances provide hope and encouragement to other people, which is another hard truth. You know, perhaps God is using you and your circumstance to provide hope and encouragement and strength to somebody else. You know, maybe these difficult things that you go through have nothing to do with you at all. You know, we... we deal with these things and something happens and, and we ask God, why? Right? Why would this happen to me, God? I don't see how this is part of your plan for me. Why would you allow this to happen to me, God? Well, maybe it has nothing to do with you. Maybe it has nothing to do with you at all. Maybe God knows that you're strong enough to handle it and by letting you go through this, you're in some way providing strength and hope and encouragement to somebody else who really needs it. 
Maybe you will strengthen someone else's faith by what you're dealing with. Maybe by going through it with grace, you'll provide hope. Maybe you'll, you'll bring somebody else closer to God in their relationship with God. Kind of ties back into what I said earlier. It's not always about me. Paul then, in his letter, he goes on to reiterate the mission of the Jesus follower, and that mission is to preach Christ. He said that some of the brothers were strengthened to preach more boldly, and then in verse 15, he says, some indeed preach Christ from envy, rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. You know, it's really unclear as to who Paul's talking about or what exactly he's talking about here, but apparently there were people that were preaching Christ with improper motives, and they were in some way happy or joyful over the fact that Paul was in prison. And it seems as though there were some people that had it out for Paul. I mean, they're not necessarily false prophets because they were preaching Christ, but for some reason they didn't like Paul, they didn't get along with Paul. In fact, Paul later states here in a minute, we'll read it, that he rejoices because they were preaching in the name of Jesus. And it's kind of hard to understand what exactly Paul is saying here, but, but we've all seen Christians who have acted this way. We all see Christians who act with improper motives. Christians that are happy at other people's misfortune. You know, they, they do things not out of love, but out of selfish ambition. And apparently that's what Paul was dealing with in this moment. But you know what he didn't do? Paul didn't let it affect him. At least not that we're aware of. Paul didn't let it change his outlook on life. You know, too many Christians will let other people define them. Too many people will, will let what somebody else says, what somebody else does, completely uplift or completely deflate their own spirit and their own self-worth. We get too caught up in what so-and-so says about me or how so-and-so thinks about me or how many comments or likes I get on my Facebook post or on social media. And we get too wrapped up in other people's opinions of us. Paul didn't. We, sh we shouldn't be that person. We shouldn't be people that are caught up or, or our worth is defined by what other people say or do to us. You know, the fact is, something's valued is determined by what someone else is willing to pay for it, right? If Matt's got a tractor for sale, and I don't care what the blue book value is on it, I'm only willing to give him 10 grand for it, and he sells it to me for 10 grand, the value of that tractor was 10 grand. Even if the book said it should be 20. The value of something is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. You were purchased. You've already been purchased. Peter writes a letter to the church. In 1 Peter 1.18, Peter says, Knowing that you were ransomed, or you were purchased, from the futile ways inherited by your forefathers. Right? We were all born into sin. Because Adam sinned, sin entered humanity, we were all born into sin. We have all been condemned. And Peter's saying we were purchased out of that condemnation. And he says, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. We were purchased. You were purchased by God, and it cost him his son. God is the only one who gets to define your value. And he already did. He defined your value when he sent his son to the cross, and Jesus confirmed that value when Jesus denied himself and said, even though I don't want to, I'm going to hang on this cross. I will die a gruesome death 
for you. It is God and God alone who gets to define you. Not other people. Not what other people think of you. Not what other people say or what they do. It is God and God alone. And God thinks that you are to die for. Literally. So, what of these other people that are seemingly against me? Right? Because Paul is still dealing with them. But in verse 18, Paul says, what then? Right? What am I supposed to do then? He says, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I will rejoice. <clears throat> Paul says, I don't care what their motives are for preaching Jesus. I don't care if they're the proper motives or if they're improper, selfish reasons. Jesus is being preached, and because of that, I'm going to rejoice. Paul was resolute in knowing his mission and his mission, his purpose, and his identity. Everything about Paul was focused on bringing honor and glory to God and to Christ. Whether for the right reasons or not, Paul said, if Christ is proclaimed, I will have So let me ask you this. Where do you find yourself today? Where do you find yourself on the topic of control? Right? Are you the control freak? Are you trying to control every aspect of your life, everything that happens to you? And when you lose control, do you panic and get worried and anxious and wonder, what am I going to do next? Or are you mellow yellow? Right? Are you kind of go with the flow? You understand that all things happen. And I'm not going to get panicked, and I'm not going to worry. I'm going to trust God. On that scale of control, where would you put yourself today? What about how you define yourself? Do you define yourself based on other people's thoughts, based on other people's opinions, based on the number of people that like me? Or do you find, define yourself based on God? Do you understand that you've already been defined? And it doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what people do. It doesn't matter how many more comments and likes she got on her post than I did. Where do you fall on that scene? You know, reading the words of the Apostle Paul here, it's incredibly obvious to me that Paul truly believed in the steady hand of a good and sovereign. Paul knew that he was protected by God's strength. He knew that he was preserved by God's love. And he lived his life beneath the shadow of God's wing. Do you? You know, Proverbs 21.30 says that no wisdom or understanding or counsel can avail against the Lord. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. Lamentations 3.37 says, Who has spoken and it come to pass unless the Lord has commanded? Let's just be, be honest with yourself for a moment this morning. Control is an illusion. Control is something that we will never possess. You know, there's nothing that you can do to engineer your own problem-free life, and there is absolutely nothing that you can do to, to control other people to make them act and behave in a way that you want them to behave. Control is an illusion. The reality is, the only aspect of our life that we can control is how we respond. I tell my kids this all the time. You cannot change or affect the way that people think of you. You cannot change the way that people act. You cannot make them do things a certain way. The only thing you can do is control how you respond to them. You know, Paul could have moped around. He could have whined. He could have complained. He could have blamed other people. He could have shook his fist at heaven and said, why, God? That's probably what I would have done. But Paul chose joy. He chose to use his circumstances 
whether good or bad, whether my fault or, or not, no matter what happens to me in my life, Paul said, I will use my circumstances to tell other people about Jesus. And I will trust God no matter what. Will you do the same? Which route will you take? Will you choose one that trusts God no matter what? Or will you take the route of selfishness and self-pity? Asking God why? Or will you take the route of peace? Take the route of peace knowing that there is a reason for what's happening to me. Maybe it's God molding me into the person that he wants to be, and it's part of that construction process. Maybe it has nothing to do with me at all. Maybe it's to spread the gospel. Or maybe this is happening to me just to strengthen and encourage someone else. No matter what happens to you in your life, I want to encourage you this morning to choose to respond as Paul. Respond with joy. Choose to trust God. God is good. And God is sovereign. And God is still in control. Father God, I thank you so much for the truth that is in that statement. You, God, are in control. That you are not just sitting by idly and passively watching our world spin. But you are active and alive and you are in this world and in control. And God, sometimes in our life we fail to trust you. We wonder why these things happen. It, it confuses us. It makes us anxious and worried. But God, I pray that we would trust you. God, we know that all things happen for the good, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And I pray that that would be on our hearts constantly this week. We would put our trust in you, in your goodness. God, and let us, as the Apostle Paul, let us be a billboard for you, for the goodness of your son Jesus and the grace and mercy we get through him. God, let us use our lives to spread your gospel and to strengthen and encourage one another. Thank you, Lord, and I praise you for all the many ways that you bless us. And it's in Jesus' name.